If not, let's cover the last words of Jesus Christ as we begin a new year. Our tradition has been, and it's not bad to have traditions, by the way, if they're good. Our tradition has been, at the beginning of every new year, we have a lesson or two or few about the Lord Jesus Christ specifically. And the reason we do that is not because we never talk about him any other time. It's just that we want to reorient ourselves, to remind ourselves that the reason why we meet, the reason why that we are, and why we're saved is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we start every new year out with that. So if you go back in the years previous, you'll find at the beginning of every year, we've dealt with either Jesus Christ and his natures, his deity attributes, who he is and who he was, what he's done, his importance, his preeminence, uh, all these things uh, to ourselves as Christians, as followers of him, as believers in him. He is our Lord which is a word you don't use anywhere else but church, right, typically. Uh, you don't go to work and say, hello, Lord, um, to your boss. It's not a word that we use. But he is our Lord. Jesus Christ in the scripture is said to be the great God and our Lord and Savior. Turn to Titus 2, 13, and with the other hand, turn to Isaiah 43. I just want to show you here quickly how we know that Jesus Christ is the great God the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the eternal, the immortal, the immutable God. Isaiah 43 and Titus chapter 2. Titus 2.13. Paul says, The grace of God hath bring us, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, which we know elsewhere is a present evil world. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see that verse right there? In the King James Bible, it calls Jesus Christ God. Uh, it is not unheard of to have that verse changed in other translations, which is an issue, but uh, we're going to take the Bible as, as we see it and read it as being the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah 43 and verse 3. Going back to the Old Testament scriptures and the prophets, as Isaiah, as we'll find out in our chapter-by-chapter -chapter study, speaks a lot about the Messiah and the kingdom to Israel. Isaiah 43, verse 3 says, I am the Lord thy God. And when you see in your King James Bible, the capital L-O-R-D, all caps, that's talking about Jehovah God, right? I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. You see that? Titus 2.13, not only call Jesus God, and people try to debate about that, irrelevant to our verse here. It calls, calls Jesus Savior, very clearly, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43, verse 3 says, The Jehovah God, Holy One of Israel, is Israel's Savior. <clears throat> Talk down to verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord. You see the tetragrammaton again, the Jehovah. And beside me there is no Savior. Very clearly in the Old Testament, God of the Bible says, I am the Savior of Israel. There's no other Savior but me. I'm the Holy One of Israel, I'm the Savior of Israel, I'm the Lord of Israel, I'm the God of Israel. All talking in the first person here, right? We turn to Titus 2 and we read that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Savior, right? Jesus Christ is not only Lord, He's God, okay? Isaiah 43 verse 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. This is the God of the Old Testament, the King. Who is the King of Kings? Jesus. And this we're talking about God being a separate person, a separate being from Jesus, and he's the king, and Jesus is the king of kings, that would be contradictory. You can't be the king of kings unless you are above all other kings. Right? Jesus Christ is God. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's why we worship him. That's why uh, we trust him with our eternal soul. Because he's not just a man, right? He's God. 1 Timothy 1 17. Look at 1 Timothy 1. <clears throat> That's just one of many places, by the way, you can show from the Bible that Jesus is God in a very good place because um, it uses the description of God interchangeably with Jesus. In 1 Timothy 1, it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the... Well, I'm in 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? Who's the Savior in that verse? Well, it says God. I mean, Jesus is the Savior. We know that, surely, right? But it says, a commandment of God, our Savior. Well, Titus 2, we read, Jesus Christ is our Savior. And even this verse here puts Jesus Christ right there with it. 
All I'm trying to show you is that when the Bible speaks about the Savior, there's no other Savior of mankind but Jesus Christ. There's no other Savior of mankind but God. If Jesus wasn't God, then God's not saving you. Right? There's only one Savior and none other. It's the God. And in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and Titus 2.13, it's Jesus Christ. That's putting a name to him there. So 1 Timothy 1, Paul starts with this. This commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope unto Timothy, my son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. And so we learn this teaching. Drop down to verse oh, 15. No, no, no. I want verse 12 and 13. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He was a blasphemer before. Now, why was Paul a blasphemer? You ever think about this? Was Paul a pagan, a Gentile? He worshipped false idols and this sort of thing? No. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He worshipped according to the Old Testament scriptures. He worshipped Isaiah 43, the God, the Holy One, the no other Savior. And when he heard Peter and these guys preaching Jesus, this man from Nazareth, as a Savior, what does Paul instinctively say? And scripturally. He says, Peter, you guys are heretics. Because I serve the one Savior, the Holy One of Israel, the only God and Savior of the Old Testament, Isaiah 43. And Peter, you're saying that Galilean is the Savior? You're a heretic. But when Paul sees Jesus and is saved by the glorified Lord, knowing that he was wrong, what does that make him before? A blasphemer. Because as he was opposing Jesus, he was opposing the true God. Right? He was a blasphemer. I'm a blasphemer, a persecutor, uh, and an injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. It, mercy from who? From God, from Jesus, right? In verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Now unto the King Eternal. Who's verse 17 talking about? He's been talking about Jesus Christ in almost every verse for the last 10 or 11 verses. Now unto the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. He is Savior. Look at chapter 6, verse 15. In verse 14, Paul says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Potentate, that's not a word you use every day. You know what that means, potentate? What if you had some chili that someone made and you took a bite and you went, whoa, that's potent. What's that mean? That's powerful, that's strong, right? Potentate is a strong one. In the Old Testament, the word would be almighty. You've heard that? The Lord God almighty, right? And it says here in the verse, what? The blessed and only potentate, the strongest one, the great almighty one, right? And Jesus Christ will show who is this blessed and only potentate, almighty one, who is the what? King of kings, Lord of lords. In Revelation 19, when Jesus returns to the earth to fulfill Israel's promises and covenants, what is he called? King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the almighty, the all-powerful. That's the God that we worship and serve, Jesus Christ, right? And that's why we, I want to start the year off talking about this to show you that what we believe is not just vain imaginations and something that has no evidence from the scripture and something that's hard to believe. It's only hard to believe when you don't recognize the revelation of Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Right, And so we, we are serving the God creator of the universe, the Savior of heaven and earth, the Savior of Israel and the world, and of everyone in the body of Christ today. Right? It's not just, Jesus is just, isn't just a tool in order to accomplish God's purposes. He is God manifest in the flesh. And so when God committed his love toward us, it was in Jesus Christ when he died for sinners. Right? That was God manifest in the flesh. And so with th that background, that introduction to our lesson about Jesus Christ being God and Lord and potentate and King of kings and eternal and immortal, the question we need to ask then is, how do we know Jesus? 
<laughs> you say, well, I know him as God. I know him as the Son of God. I know him as the Lord of Lords, right? What did Jesus say? We talk about who he was, but what did he actually communicate? This book isn't just about describing God, which it does do that, but also about giving us instructions and words from God. We call it the Word of God, right? And that's what the Bible itself calls it, the, the revelation of Word of God. So what did Jesus say? What were his last words? If it's true that Jesus Christ is the manifestation, the image of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, then it's very important what he tells you, right? This is why we were dealing with the question this morning in our Q&A of, you know, is it possible to have a conversation with Jesus? You know, why would someone want to talk to Jesus? Well, he's an important historical figure. Yeah, more so than that, he is the Son of God, right? He's the Lord. Well, what did he say then? What was his last words? This is very significant, what Jesus communicated. Specifically, what were the last things he communicated? Right, what's, the, what's the final dying wish? What was his last will and testament? What was the last instruction and commission and, and, and purpose articulated for us who are saved by him? You want to do his will? You better know what he said. Right? What were the last words of Jesus Christ? And so we'll cover here for the next 15 minutes or so the seven things that Jesus Christ said on the cross. Have you studied these seven things? You've probably heard them taught before. If not all of them, a few of them. Right? Uh, seven things Jesus said on the cross, the so-called last words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I put them in order, at least the order that I think they happened in, and you can be persuaded in your own mind about that order, but I think this is, is, is a pretty good order. Okay, what happened is when Jesus was sentenced and condemned to crucifixion, we won't cover all that story, but when the Jews said crucify him, and Pilate says, fine, do with him what you want. Hands him over to the Roman soldiers, the Roman soldiers beat him, right, they... they they, they, they beat him, they put a thorn of crowns on his head, they mock him with purple clothes and a robe like a king and this sort of thing. They put the cross on him, and he has to bear that cross up to Calvary, which means the hill of the skull, right? Uh, which is called Golgotha in, in, uh, in Matthew, I believe. And so when he gets up there, they nail him to the cross, and when they crucify him, the first thing we have recorded that Jesus says, now he may have said other things, we're talking about from the scripture here, what he said in the scripture. He says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. This is in Luke 23, 34. You've heard that before, right? Father, forgive them. They know what they do. When they were nailing him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. And by the way, God did give Israel another chance. At the cross there, God didn't say, that's it, I'm done. They killed my son. Israel's out of here. We know, of course, after he rose from the dead, he sent his disciples right back to the same people and said, you killed him, repent, so that God can continue with his kingdom program. That's my paraphrase, right? And so he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And part of the reason why he said that, of course, was, yes, they rejected him, and so thus they were obviously ignorant. But he hadn't raised from the dead yet, which Paul says that his declaration of being the Son of God, and Jesus himself said that the only sign I'll give you is I'll raise from the dead, the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he hadn't done that yet. And so he had performed miracle after miracle, and they still didn't believe him, but he hadn't raised from the dead yet. And so he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. But when he raises from the dead and the apostles minister to Israel, the resurrected Lord, there's no more excuse, is there? Right? They should have seen the testimony of the Holy Spirit in, in the apostles. But this is the first thing Jesus said, or rather the first recorded thing we have that he said. After they crucify him, he's on the cross there, and you have uh, uh, the, uh, the soldiers who beat him and nailed him there, started to cast lots for his clothes and his raiment, fulfilling prophecy, right, back there in Psalms. And he sees the Marys. I say the Marys because there's at least three of them uh, standing there. Mary goes, mother, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of, uh, or the, the Mary of, uh, the mother of uh, Cleophas, I think is, is the name. So you have Marys there, and you have John over here, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, according to the Gospel of John. And he turns to the woman, Mary, and his mother, and says, Mary, John, of course he's not pointing, he's nailed to the cross. He says, woman, behold thy son. And then he says to the son, John, he says, behold thy mother. And so from that point on, John, you know, and, and Mary, uh, John took care of Mary as his, his mother, as the Lord instructed him to do in John 19, 26 and 27. So we find that happening. At that point, you see the soldiers who apparently were done casting lots or whatnot, starting to mock Jesus, mocking him because he was claiming to be the king, claiming to be the Lord, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, and uh, he's nailed on a cross. And so that was easy to put down this Savior. Um, we just put him on a cross. Apparently he can't get any further than a nail can take him. And he had two thieves and malefactors next to him on the cross, and they started mocking him. You remember the story, right? So they start mocking him and say, why don't you just jump down from there if you're so powerful and all this. And so to the one thief who actually defends Jesus, 
he turns to and says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Remember this? We covered a little bit about this last Tuesday, talking about paradise. But Luke 23, 43, the one thief is, is blaming him. The other thief says, why are you doing that? You're on the cross too. And he says, don't you know this guy is, is the son of God? And he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. People like to use that example to show how you can be saved without water baptism, which it's true. You can be saved without water baptism. It's hard to water baptize someone when they're nailed to a cross. But <laughs> uh, the gospel that the apostles were preaching was repentance in the name of Jesus and water baptism for the remission of sins to enter into Israel's covenant and their kingdom. Water baptism was a requirement. It was not optional. You say, well, he was nailed to the cross. Yes, he was dying. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Water baptism never saves anybody, but it was something that the covenants required, just like in John 14, where Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, verse 10, right? So if they didn't keep the commandments of Jesus, what would happen? They wouldn't enter in that kingdom. Right. See, the covenants had requirements for them to do. Even though it doesn't save them, you enter that contract, you've got to fulfill. The new covenant for Israel, God said, I'll give my Holy Spirit to help you fulfill these things. Right. Thank God that we're not saved by a covenant, but rather purely and freely by God's grace. When you're saved trusting in the finished work of Jesus, it's finished. There's nothing he has yet to do or he has yet promised to do. He simply says, I've done it. Trust what I've done on the cross in my resurrection and your sins will be forgiven. You trust it. And the transaction's complete, right? He, his sufficiency and his forgiveness and his reconciliation have all been applied to you by belief in the gospel. Meanwhile, continue with the story of the last breaths of Jesus on the cross there. You have the mocking going on by the thieves and by those around him. And around the sixth hour, the sky turns dark. Remember that? The sky turns dark for three hours, the sky is dark. And at that point, he screams, he cries out, My God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the Hebrew, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, he says, right? And so Matthew 27 and Mark 15, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which, of course, is a quote from Psalm 22. It's at this point that some people will say, This is where God separated himself from Jesus. Just for a moment. Uh, that is called heresy. I mean, heresy happens all the time. It's something very common, but it's heresy. Avoid it, because it's wrong. Uh, God never separated himself from Jesus. He says, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he's about to die, right? And he doesn't deserve to die. And Psalm 22 talks about this. And read Psalm 22 after verse 1. It talks about God being the, uh, the ever-present help and how he's not helping in this situation. And that's true. In Psalm 22, Jesus is nailed to the cross, and though they were mocking him, saying, jump down, save yourself, what doesn't happen? There's nothing he does, right? There's no help coming from God, right? There's no help. And thus he cries out, fulfilling Psalm 22, why hast thou forsaken me? I am dying, essentially is what he's saying. God's not helping me off this cross. And of course, that was purposed, and he knew that. He knew that in the garden when he was sweating blood. He knew he was going to die, Right? And yet he fulfills Psalm 22. He's quoting Psalms, fulfilling the prophets. You read that in Matthew and Mark. After this point, at, at some point after he cries this out to the Lord, they think that he's talking about Elijah, but he's really not. And um, he says, I thirst. Remember that? It's two words, I thirst. And the soldiers come and they grab some vinegar. And they give him some vinegar to drink, which also fulfills prophecy. In fact, after he drinks the vinegar, that's apparently the last prophecy fulfilled, necessary in his earthly life, because after it says in John, after these things were finished, after it was fulfilled, he says, it is finished, in John 19.30. The famous words of Jesus, it is finished. To which many people, you and I included, would say, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross and his resurrection, completed all the work necessary to save you. And so the fact that he said it is finished is poetic. It's like he's on the cross there doing the most important thing in human history. It is finished, and we preach the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But you know what hadn't happened by the time he said that? He hadn't died. He hadn't risen from the dead. He hadn't revealed the mystery of Christ. He hasn't dispensed his grace. You can't be saved. These disciples are preaching the, uh, the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know he was going to be resurrected. What am I saying? There's been a lot of preacher exaggeration and spiritualization of things in the Bible. Just be careful here. Am I saying it's wrong to say Jesus finished the work by the cross? No, it's not wrong at all. It's true. But Jesus was not communicating the completed work that he was doing by saying it is finished. Read John 19. Let's, let's go there now and read it. John 19. In John 19.30. Just 
1930. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, or he said, I thirst before, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Let's go to verse 28, rather. That's where I need to go. At verse 20, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled a sponge with vinegar, put it upon hyssop, put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. What's verse 28 say? That now was accomplished, all the scriptures might be fulfilled, right? Is there a mystery in verse 28? Is there the revelation of the mystery there? Something that was kept secret from the prophets? No. What the prophet said would happen, by the way, is very important. Because all these prophecies that are fulfilled here, many in one day, is proof that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And the scripture is God's word, because this, that can't happen. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, hundreds of them fulfilled. That's why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John consistently say, as it was written, and to fulfill the prophets, to show you this isn't some random story of some random man in history, but it was the fulfillment of what had been spoken centuries before by people claiming to speak for God. So the validation of the word of God through these verses are, is extremely valuable, right? So to fulfill all that he came to accomplish, to the earth to accomplish, he said, it is finished. But there was a lot of things he had yet to do. That's what I'm trying to say. In fact, even today we know Jesus still has to return, doesn't he? Titus 2.13, we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. I mean, if Jesus said, this is it, I'm done, I'm going you know, upstairs and playing PlayStation, you know, uh, then he wouldn't return, would he? You know, he has to come back, at least. There's many other things that has to be done in, in God's purpose and plan. Why he says that is when he came to earth, all the things that needed to be accomplished, fulfilled on earth, was done. The next thing that happens is he says, what? In Luke 23, 40, you don't see anything in verse 30 about what he says. He says he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But there's one more thing that he said in Luke 23, 46. It is finished, he said. And part of him bowing his head and giving up the ghost is him saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. And he gave up the ghost. So that was it. He was at seven things that he said. Very interesting to learn from these things about what he said. And many people have preached on these things in the past about what he said. But, and here's the point of the lesson this morning, these are not the last words of Jesus. I bring them up because I'm not the first one to pull them out. People have studied these for years, centuries, right? And they, they focus on these last final words, the dying breath of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, bleeding there, for, you know. And that's what they're focusing on. These are not the last words of Jesus. Is the cross important? Yes. Is what he said here important? Yes. But these are not the last words of Jesus. And if Jesus is God and Savior and Lord and King and potentate and head of all things, then we need to know what he said, especially what he said, you know, lately, recently. I mean, he said something else. What else did he say? He's dead. Yeah, but we believe, don't we, that he rose from the dead. Now, this is where we enter Christian belief. Okay, because up to this point, the world has no problem talking about these things. I mean, they don't believe the Bible necessarily, but you know, whatever. Use it as historical reference. There was a man named Jesus who lived in Galilee, who was crucified in Jerusalem, and he maybe said these things, fine, whatever, irrelevant. And he died, right? But that's not Christian belief. You say, well, they're followers of Jesus. That's true. But you don't get saved by God's grace and become part of the body of Christ until... Jesus says other things, right? That's the important part. He died, and three days later, he rose from the dead, right? And that resurrected Jesus started saying things again. And so we're not done here. But what's interesting is that we are done with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're at the end of these books, right? Matthew 27, Luke 23, John 19, Mark 15. The, the story of Jesus' earthly ministry to Israel is now over. Thus he said, it is finished, right? But he rose from the dead and started speaking again. And this is very significant. In 2 Corinthians 5.15, this is why I asked you earlier, how do we know Jesus? It's very common, and uh, even ourselves are guilty of this because of our upbringing, perhaps our cultural background, perhaps because we're just human, and we need to sympathize with the humanity of Jesus, which is true, he's human. But he's also God. How do you know Jesus? We tend to think of Jesus as a first century Jew who lived, walked on water, uh, you know, multiplied the loaves and fishes, right? had some disciples, and died 2,000 years ago. All true. But that's how we think about him. Every time I say Jesus, this is what you think of. You think, yeah, first century Jew. I mean, it's, it's out of context for the 21st century. Right? It's historical. 
It's ancient. That's Jesus. People say, if Jesus were alive today, uh, he is alive today, right? Isn't that what you believe as Christians? So you can never say, if he were alive today, he is alive today, right? But that's how we kind of think just naturally. Oh, yeah, he was back there, you know, with Caesar and everybody, you know. What about in world history? Yeah, he was historical, but truly, Jesus before Abraham was, right? Truly, Jesus was the creator of Israel. Jesus was in the beginning, why all things were made by him. And he's the end. He's, in fact, he's the beginning and the end. He's alive today. He's the eternal God, right? And more importantly, according to who you are in Christ, he's the head of the body of Christ. And that's not something you learn about in Matthew, Luke, and John, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul talks about how we should know Jesus. In verse 15, we, we've said before, of course, that even though the four Gospels uh, that were written there about Jesus' earthly ministry end with the death and the resurrection, Paul's Gospel, in 1 Corinthians 15, begins with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 5, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians, he says that Christ died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, so it's not just the death, it's the resurrection that's important. Verse 16, Wherefore, for this reason, that we live for him who is now risen, for this reason, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. After the flesh is the implication. Now we just read the last seven things Jesus said in the flesh, on the cross, before he gave up the ghost. But this passage says, and he rose again. The reason why we live for Jesus is not because of the life he lived before he died. The reason why we live for Jesus is because of the life he lived since he died. That's the reason we love the Lord and know that he's the Lord and serve him as the eternal God. Okay? And this is why it's, when we talk about the last words of Jesus, that now there should be a giant question mark. Why aren't more people talking about the words of Jesus after his death and resurrection? You say, well, some do. Okay, some do. There are some things we can read about. Look at Matthew 28. These are the so-called great commissions for the church, right? Because people will affirm the resurrection. In fact, it's a fundamental Christianity. Paul says, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you're yet in your sins, and our preaching is vain. So Christians world over, if you're a Christian, will affirm the resurrection of Christ. This is why Paul was persecuted, by the way. Paul was ministering at the very top of your outline. It says his accusers had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and one of Jesus, which was dead, everyone knew that, whom Paul, uniquely, Paul affirmed to be alive. We'll see why that's important in a moment. See, the issue wasn't the death of Jesus. The issue was, Paul, you're saying he's alive, and he's the Son of God and the Messiah. Right, so that's the big difference. In Matthew 28 is Jesus, after his death, after he rose from the dead, there's things Jesus said. So these are important, right? I mean, he died, but now what? 28, verse 19 and 20, you all know this being the greatest commission by all Baptists, right? the largest denomination. That doesn't mean it's the only commission in the Bible. But it says in verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them. This is what makes Christianity Christianity to the degree that in verse 18, Jesus is speaking after his death. If a dead man starts talking to you, what do you conclude naturally? <coughs> He's not dead. Right? Jesus is speaking here. All power is given unto me. Now, we just covered before what Paul called Jesus. Remember? The blessed and only potentate. What's he say here? All power. Is there any power that's not given to him? No. You see? That's resurrected Jesus, right? Now, earthly Jesus, how much power did he have? And that's a question people dispute. But he raised from the dead, raised up to glory. He's seated in heavenly places. All power is given unto me. Right? You read prophecies about that, how in Psalm 2, uh, Jesus is raised from the dead, and it's that day that he's begotten as the Son of God because he's, he's given authority. Matthew 20, it's actually talking about the kingdom where all power is given unto him in heaven and earth, and Jesus sits on the throne in Israel. That's what Matthew 28 is all about. Because in the kingdom, he, he'll tell Israel, his holy nation, to go teach all nations... If you're the nation of Israel, how do I say this? You can only do this if you're the nation of Israel. Because you only teach all nations if you're not one of them. Nations are the Gentiles, and if you're Israel, you can go to all nations. Right? 
If you are one of the nations, how can you go to all nations? You're already in one of them. You see, so it won't work. But he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Typically, people just like the go part. Because everyone's sitting down at church, so go. And uh, that's what they preach. But he says, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. People like that because they can argue against different denominations about how you baptize. And you've got to say all three names. And, and apologists will talk about the Trinity there, the three persons and the, the Godhead and all that. But what are you supposed to teach all nations? Hmm? Teach them about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Teach them about Jesus and show them the, the, the Jesus movie. And verse 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Already. Jesus spoke things to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He taught the law in Matthew 23. He spoke about the kingdom come, and he tells them to teach people those things that I've said. So he's referring back to things he spoke before he died. Right? I only bring this up because Matthew 28, though he is speaking after his death, is referring back to things he spoke of before he died. Paul says we don't know man after the flesh. Yea, even Christ, we don't know after the flesh anymore. What did Jesus say to you? Look at Mark 16. After Jesus raised from the dead, he said this. Verse 15. He said unto them, again, uh, proving he's risen. Dead men don't talk. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a banner verse right there. Put that on your missionary statement. Go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What gospel are they preaching? It's not yours, because in verse 16, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, Baptists don't like that one, because uh, Baptists don't believe baptism saves you. But the Church of Christ loves that one, because the Church of Christ teaches that baptism saves you. And Mark 16, 16 seems to say so. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. The Church of Christ kind of ended in verse 16 and verse 17. The Pentecostals pick up the, the banner. Because these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and drink. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so that's the commission they're, they're doing. right? The snake handlers in West Virginia. That's what they're, where they get it right there. And this is why John MacArthur and most every modern textual Bible critic will say that these last 12 verses in Mark are not authentic. Jesus never said these things. Why? It doesn't sound like Jesus. But you know what you've done inadvertently? Not only have you cast doubt on the scripture, of which there's abundant proof these things are inspirational and authoritative, but secondly, you've taken out the evidence in Mark of Jesus' resurrection. Right? In Mark, he'll die, empty tomb. Does he say anything? Nope. <laughs> What's the proof? Right? Whoops. Also, you tend to take away the reason why Revelation is written referring to the signs and powers and wonders God gave to Israel to get through that tribulation period. They really made a mess of things trying to take this thing out. These signs did follow them that believed in early Acts. These signs will follow them that believe in the book of Revelation when serpents come out of the fiery pit. Right? You'll need these things. Verse 19 says, Then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Look at Luke 24. <clears throat> you know what Jesus said? Glorified in his resurrected body. After he died, put off this mortal flesh, put on immortality. He's walking <clears throat> with a few disciples on the Emmaus Road. Remember that? And the first words out of his mouth are, You fools! <laughs> You fools. Luke 24, 25. He said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered his glory? Didn't you know that this whole death and resurrection is supposed to happen according to prophets? That's what he says. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village where they went, and, and so on and so forth. And you have the story there. But Jesus spoke some words here, and he spoke what Moses expounded, what the prophets said, and what the scriptures wrote. Right, up to that point. In Luke 24, 49, <clears throat> he appears again to his disciples. He eats some honeycomb over here. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That's interesting. He's talking about something that will happen. Last words of Jesus. It is finished? No. 
He resurrected from the dead. He appeared to his apostles, and he said, Wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Now, if that's where you stop in Luke 24, what's the mission for the church? I mean, we're not Jerusalem, obviously, but maybe as a company of believers, we could be called God's holy people, and this could be a holy place, so we should come together frequently to wait upon the Lord until His Holy Spirit gets rained down on us, and we can all stand up in power. I mean, you're all sitting down right now like a dead church. If you stand up, you got power, right? And so this is what people do at church. They go to church, and they're praying the Holy Spirit down and waiting for Him to come, and then they'll tarry, and when He comes, everyone's hallelujah, right? Luke 24, following Jesus' words. Are these the last words of Jesus? Did that happen? Yeah, it did. It already happened. Jesus spoke again. Look at John 20. This is the Roman Catholic favorite commission because the Roman Catholics, though, will spiritualize many parts of the Bible, the church being set as the authority over Scripture in their, in their belief system, um, one of the few places they'll take literally is in John 6 and in John 20. And in John 20, ver verse uh, 23, Jesus appears unto his disciples. And he says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So he says, You have the power to forgive sins now which just earlier in his ministry was called blasphemy by the Pharisees and the priests because Jesus would forgive sins. They said only God can forgive sins, which was fine for Jesus, him being God in the flesh. But what about these disciples here? They're not God. But Jesus, being the judge, grants them authority to forgive sins. Folks, this is not your commission. You have no authority to forgive anyone's sins. Preachers spiritualize this, including some of Bereans, and they'll say, well, what Jesus meant there is that he wants them to preach the gospel of forgiveness of sins, so that you and I today, preaching forgiveness of sins through Jesus' blood, are kind of forgiving people's sins. I mean, you preach the gospel to someone, they believe it, their sins get forgiven, aren't you doing that? And the answer is unequivocally, no, you're not forgiving their sins, God forgives their sins, you're simply preaching the message of forgiveness through faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. That's not what they're preaching, by the way, but... It's very different. They have the power to remit sins. These people are rulers, and they've been given the keys of the kingdom where they can loose and bind, forgiving sins, retaining sins. And so Peter and these guys, like popes, have the authority to say, your sins are forgiven, or your sins are not. Drop dead. Right? They could do that. You cannot. By grace, we're sinners that need Christ's finished work on the cross. And forgiveness is granted freely to all who believe, with or without you. Okay, You have nothing to do with someone else's forgiveness of sins. Meanwhile, we have this commission Jesus gave his disciples here. In John 21, he says, let's go get dinner. Talking about last words and all. John 21, verse 12. Jesus says unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing it was the Lord. I mean, he looks a little different. What did you do with your hair? And uh, they didn't want to say anything. Jesus then comes and takes bread and gives them and fish likewise. What he's not doing here, by the way, is drinking the fruit of the vine, which he said he would not do till he comes again in his kingdom. Fish. Let's say anything about fish. He's eating fish and bread with them. That's what's going on here. Look at Acts chapter 1. Jesus rose from the dead. This is very clear and very important to realize when we talk about what Jesus said and to whom he said it. His death on the cross was not the end. Right? Acts 1, verse 4. Oh, I need verse 3, rather. This is verse 3. He showed to his apostles, he showed himself to his apostles alive after his passion, the passion being his death, by many infallible proofs. Now, we've already covered a few, right? The infallible proofs to his disciples, his apostles, <laughs> that he was risen are the fact that he appeared and spoke to them. Don't remove those passages, they're important. He says, Many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus here is speaking more words. Right? But we only preach the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the red letters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, he spoke more words after that, you know. He spoke more words. All every full gospel preacher will tell you that. You know the full gospel denomination? They teach the full gospel being not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like most churches teach. They say we preach the full gospel which continues into Acts. To which I say, hooray! You're moving on in the Bible. 
right? They just don't go far enough in the book of Acts. They stop around Acts 2, 3, or 4, and 5. But they'll preach the full gospel. Acts 1, verse 3 here, speaking to them pertaining to the things uh, of the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, full gospel's charismatic in that way. Waiting for the Holy Ghost. But see, Jesus is speaking things here. Now, what's he speaking about the kingdom of God? You think he's talking about, well, guys, you thought I was going to come back and like actually reign on the earth in a kingdom? Wrong. You think that's what he was communicating there? I doubt it, because in verse 6, Peter, after 40 days of teaching, says, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So either Peter's dense, or that's not what Jesus was saying. Instead, he was saying things like, all right, now that I'm back, you guys got to go out there and preach the kingdom. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit here soon, and he'll give you power, so just wait around for that. Don't go out before. And by the way, you better preach in Jerusalem and stay there, even if they persecute you. And by the way, the things I'm saying now are the same things he said before he died. But he's probably reaffirming this, because your Savior dies, your you know, Messiah dies, the King dies, you tend to get a little shaken. Are you doing that again? Like, you know, are you, are you sticking around? What's happening? And so he's reaffirming these things he told them about the Holy Spirit coming, the King is going to, the kingdom's going to come, and, you know, and all, all this business. In Luke chapter 21, he says that I'll give you the Holy Spirit who will give you the words to say. Right. And so he's speaking these things pertaining to that kingdom. In Acts 1 7, Jesus says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father will put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is talking about the kingdom, by the way. You see, he says the uttermost parts of the earth. Yes, that's after Jerusalem and after Judea and after Samaria. There's a clear order here. Right? And he said that Luke 24, stay in Jerusalem until. And he said it in Matthew 15, where he says, preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? The kingdom, every time you see that word kingdom in relation to the earthly prophetic kingdom, the kingdom come to earth, is always in Israel. Right? It begins in Israel and then spreads across the earth. Because God didn't promise the kingdom would come anywhere else except for Israel and then to the earth. Right? These, in verse 8, are the last words of Jesus Christ after his resurrection and before his ascension. Next verse, he had spoken these things, they beheld, and he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he's gone. Again, <laughs> he died three days, rose from the dead. He talks to him for 40 days about things pertaining to the kingdom, says, wait for the Holy Ghost, he'll teach you some things. Jesus leaves, and they're waiting around. Are they talking to Jesus? No. Is Jesus talking to them? No. Is Peter wake up, waiting for the Holy Spirit, saying, Jesus is talking to me today. I heard a fresh word from Jesus today, Mary. That's not what's going on. Jesus already spoke things to them. He's not speaking now. He's ascended to heaven, and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit gives them words to say. Right? You learn about that. In fact, in Acts chapter 1 here, except for a couple, thing, a couple places I'll, I'll tell you, there's no other place in the Hebrew epistles, or rather the books written by these apostles, where Jesus speaks to them again. He spoke to them for three years. Matthew, Mark, and John. He spoke to them after his resurrection for 40 days. He leaves. The Holy Ghost comes, and you don't read record of them, him speaking to them again. The only exception is the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, and Jesus speaks about John pertaining to the kingdom of God that would come to the earth, right? There's a whole couple chapters there that are red letters, Jesus saying, write to the churches, here's what you're going to write, right? And at the very end of Revelation 22, he says, I come quickly, and these sorts of things, Jesus says, right? Jesus speaks in Revelation. The only other uh, exception is by Ananias, who wasn't one of the twelve apostles. Remember Ananias? Jesus spoke to him. But what did he say to Ananias? Go help Paul, right? So, if you're looking for the last words of Jesus, after he ascended to heaven, and we're not living in Revelation, what did Jesus say? Look at Acts 9. Remember, this is all began with not just us picking and choosing our favorite Bible person. Jesus Christ is God. He is the potentate, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He is your Savior. What did he say? He said it is finished, yep. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Yes. He rose from the dead and said, you fool, didn't you know this was supposed to happen? He said, wait in Jerusalem to the Holy Spirit. Then preach in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And then in Acts 9, when Saul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him. 
and Jesus speaks again. For the first time since Acts chapter 1, Jesus speaks. And he speaks to Paul. What's he say in Acts 9? He says in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. We have the words of Jesus here. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and there shall be told thee what thou must do. I am curious what Jesus is going to tell Paul to do, aren't you? Because he already told his apostles what to do. He already told them. He left. And now he appears to this guy, this persecutor, this blasphemer, who's not even Israel, in Israel. He's not in Judea or Samaria. He's in near Damascus, outside of Israel. And he says, go to the city, this Gentile city, and I'll tell you what to do. Wow, we have to wait? What is, what is he going to do? In Acts chapter 9, later down in the passage, it says in verse 10, that a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, uh, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Jesus speaking to Ananias, said, Behold, I am here, Lord, Ananias says. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias, recognizing Saul, says, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But Jesus said unto, them, unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Jesus affirms Saul, right? To Ananias. He told his 12 apostles in Jerusalem what to do. Preach in Jerusalem. Jerusalem gets rejected. The, uh, the disciples flee. Ananias is one of the guys who fled Jerusalem because of the persecution of Saul. The next time we read about Jesus speaking is to Saul when he says, stay here. And he speaks to Ananias and says, you, kingdom believer, go talk to Saul. Do it. I'm sending him to go to the Gentiles. You see an important revelation here, a progressive revelation? We call ourselves Pauline, or we say we found the doctrine of the church and the epistles of Paul, and sometimes I think we tend to doubt ourselves regarding that. We tend to think, well, maybe we're being a little sectarian about this. Maybe we're, we're just you know, majoring on the minors. Folks, do not believe that. Jesus Christ is God. He is the Lord. And when you look at what he said, the last words of Jesus Christ in the scriptures were given to that man. We have them in red letters in your Bible, if you have a red letter Bible. He says, go to Saul. I'm sending him to the Gentiles. And by the way, this is not the last time Jesus spoke. Toward the last words of Jesus, right? Well, where's that end? Not here. I already told you the last time he spoke to his kingdom apostles, which is significant. The last time Jesus spoke to them. So when Paul goes to Peter and says, Jesus, talk to me. When's the last time he talked to you? Peter's going, Acts 1, right? Before Holy Ghost? That's the last time he talked to me. I mean, the Holy Ghost has been talking through me, but, you know, Jesus, I haven't seen him since he, you know, heaven. He sent him up to heaven. The angel rebuked us. Why are you looking up? Look down, you know. Paul says, I spoke to him. Not once, not twice. I speak, spoken to him many times. Wow, nah. That's what the response from Peter and the disciples. No, we don't believe it. Why? Why wouldn't they believe it? Why wouldn't they say, Paul, gracious brother, Jesus speaks to everybody every day, as Christians talk today, right? Just this morning, Jesus spoke to me. To have Fruit Loops and not, you know, honey grams. You know, why do Christians talk like this? Jesus spoke to certain people. He stopped speaking to the, the Peter and the apostles. He went to heaven. The Holy Ghost was sent down. And then Jesus appeared to Paul, spoke to him, and spoke to him many times. You want to know what Jesus said? Read the scripture, folks. Read the apostles that he sent. You're called an apostle. Jesus spoke to you and sent you out. That's why Paul is called an apostle. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. So you're making some pretty dogmatic statements, Jesus. How, how do you know that Jesus didn't speak to Peter? You know, I don't know what the Bible doesn't tell me. So you're right. I, I have to concede that there could be, maybe there was, who knows, where Jesus spoke to Peter and, and James and John one day as they were walking in the garden and the birds were singing and they were walking with Jesus and he was, maybe, but you know, I, I don't find that. I don't find that in the scripture at all. So if the scripture is what I know about what Jesus wants us to know about what he did and what he said, 
The last time he spoke to Peter and the boys was in Acts 1. He spoke to John in Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, and then he spoke to Paul multiple times. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, Paul says, Last of all, he was seen of me. After he gives due uh, recognition to the twelve apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 5, he was seen of Peter, Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain of this present. Some are falling asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me. Also, it's one born out of due time. Seen of me. Paul says, I'm the last one to talk to Jesus. What a bold claim. Paul, how do you know he wasn't talking to Peter? Well, um, one, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. Number two, maybe Jesus told him. I'm only talking to you now, Paul. Well, why not Peter? You don't like Peter anymore? No, it's not that. I'm doing something different. Now, I'm making things up, of course. Maybe Jesus didn't say this at all. But we do know that Jesus spoke to Paul multiple times, and we know some things that he said. Okay? Look, we already read Acts chapter 9. Look at Acts 26, verse 14. You know, in Acts 9, Jesus doesn't say very much to Paul. It doesn't seem like. He says, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He says, wait in the city. But we know Jesus said more things to him than what was there. Because in Acts 26, when Paul gives his account, Paul has more words of Jesus. Acts 26, verse 14. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me. Now, Acts 26 is Paul telling King Agrippa what happened in Acts 9. King Agrippa says, Paul, tell me, that you said Jesus rose from the dead, tell me how you know this. And Paul's telling the story of how he saw Jesus and spoke to Jesus. Verse 14, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's in Acts 9. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And here's the stuff we don't have in Acts 9. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Jesus appeared to Paul after Acts 9 as well. Because Jesus said, I'm going to appear to you again. Right? Delivering thee from the people, that'd be, yeah, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Note in verse 18, Jesus sent Paul after his resurrection to preach to the Gentiles that they may receive forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? You see in verse 16, he talks about appearing to him again, so he appears to him multiple times. In Acts 18 is one instance. Look at Acts 18, verse 9. In Acts 18, Paul's ministering in Corinth, establishing a church there among the Gentiles, as Jesus told him to do. I say Jesus told him, and don't think of that lightly. That's the whole point of this morning's lesson, to think about when Jesus spoke. When I say Jesus told Paul, what I'm saying is that Jew that died 2,000 years ago rose from the dead and appeared to this guy and sent him with a purpose that was not given to Peter, James, and John. He told him to go to Corinth and start a church. He didn't tell Peter to do that. Jesus' words mean things. Okay? They're recorded in Scripture. In Acts 18, in verse oh, 09. So he's in, Corinthi in the Corinthian church. Look at verse 8. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Whoa. Didn't Paul water baptize? Yeah, he did. Then the next verse, Jesus appears to him. I wonder if he did it wrong. In verse 9, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. What city? Jerusalem? No. Corinth. Well, that's interesting. I mean, Jesus spent a lot of time in Matthew, Luke, and John talking about people in Jerusalem. And now he's talking about people in Corinth? Yeah, apparently. Jesus is changing his orientation a bit, isn't he? Where's Jesus matter? By the way, later when Paul writes the epistle of 1 Corinthians, he says in the first chapter, Christ sent me not to baptize. I know I baptized a few of you, but Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, we don't know if Jesus said anything else here, but if Paul said Christ sent me not to baptize, then Jesus apparently told him not to baptize. Right? It's not a bad place to put it right here. After he baptized a few, Jesus appears to him and said, Paul, stop. I know that's the Jewish conversion tradition. I know that's, that's you know, what I told the Peter to do. I know that's what Ananias did to you. Stop. It's going to confuse my grace. Right? Which it is. 
And so, Acts 18, verse 9 and 10, Jesus speaks. Look at Acts 22, verse 17. Now, here's what people do. They hear these things, uh, these experiences that Paul goes through, and they say, if it happened to Paul, it'll happen to me. You ever heard this idea? Well, if God treated David that way and spoke to David and spoke to Daniel and spoke to Peter, he'll speak to me. If Peter can walk on water, so can I. No, that doesn't follow. That's a fallacy. You're not Paul. You're not the dispenser of God's grace. You're not the apostle of the Gentiles. Okay? You're not God's chosen vessel to go to the Gentiles to whom he now delivers you to preach them. That's not you. Are you in the body of Christ? Yes. Are you in a new creature like Paul? Yes. Do you follow Paul's pattern of salvation? Certainly. Right? But when he uh, received and he appeared to Paul and spoke to Paul, it was at a certain time in history to do a certain thing to begin a new thing. Nothing is new with you. I don't do that just to bla blaspheme, you know, to, to blame me or something. But it's like, we're, we're not the newest people in the body. We're not, we're not new in God's program, you understand? We're a new creature, but there were people in the new creature before you were born. So, praise God for him showing grace to us peons, but he didn't start something with you and me. But he was starting something back here, right, with the apostles. But in Acts 22, uh, in verse 17, it came to pass, when I was coming again to Jerusalem, this is Paul speaking, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him, Jesus, saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Didn't Jesus say go to all nations? Get out of Jerusalem! Apparently, Jesus doesn't want Paul to minister in Jerusalem, and he wants him to minister to the Gentiles. Well, didn't Jesus say in Acts 1.8 to minister to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other the earth? Jerusalem's included in that, you know. Not to Paul, he didn't. To Paul, he said, get out of Jerusalem. See, it's a different thing, right? And so, we have Jesus speaking here to him. Look at Acts 20, 35. We have things Jesus said to Paul at times unrecorded. Now, here we have a couple words recorded, but Paul's testifying that Jesus appeared to him in visions and revelations, multiple revelations, and there are many things that apparently Jesus said to Paul that we may not have written down verbatim. Like that we can like highlight in red, right? In Acts 20, verse 35 is one of them, where Paul says, I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. The words of the Lord Jesus. Oh, Paul's going to quote Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You can spend the rest of your life trying to find that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will not find it. Okay? Jesus didn't say that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? Now, if he did, it was unrecorded. And if it was unrecorded, how did Saul know about it? Jesus spoke it to Saul. The first time we have it in the scriptures, right here in Acts 20, 35. Apparently, Jesus said things to Paul and was teaching him things, and he wrote some things down that he said, and other things he just wrote in his own words that Jesus said. Right? What am I trying to say? Jesus spoke a lot to Paul. It wasn't just on the road to Damascus. He spoke a lot to him. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul, who was not in the room, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus ate that final meal before his death, remember that? Who was there? Twelve apostles and persecutor. No. I mean, Judas was there, but Saul was not in the room. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, Paul says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed. Saul wasn't there. How does he know? Jesus was there, and he told him. Jesus spoke to Paul. Remember? You're going to be witness to these things and the things that I will appear to you. Jesus spoke to Paul, and he taught Paul these things. In Galatians 1, Paul says, I certify you, brethren, the things which I preach unto you, I preach by revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what revelation means? It's not like you wake up in the morning and you're like, I think I'm feeling the Lord talking to me. That's not it. Revelation has to do with words. When God reveals words, Jesus speak, spoke to Paul. The gospel Paul preached are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as much as you go back to Matthew, Luke, and John, and Jesus says, preach the gospel of the kingdom. The same thing. Paul goes and preaches the gospel the grace of God. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says such. All right? In 2 Corinthians 12, 1, he says, I will come to visions and revelations. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It's interesting. Read the Hebrew epistles. 
with this in mind and compare them to Paul's epistles, knowing all of it is Scripture and knowing that God inspired all of Scripture and Jesus Christ is God. So we're not trying to parse one out as better than the other. That's not it. We're trying to talk about the last words of Jesus and who he spoke to last because we're trying to figure out what's supposed to be happening now. Who was the last one to talk to Jesus? Biblical answer, Paul. Right? That was the last one. But you read the Pauline epistles, compare to the Hebrew epistles with this in mind. Look for phrases and, inclin- and, and inferences. You try to infer where Jesus is speaking to them. Did Jesus talk to this person? And when was the last time they spoke with Jesus? You'll read the Hebrew epistles, interestingly, and you won't find very, anything. Well, you'll hear them talking about Peter, James, and John, those epistles, even the book of Hebrews. It's about what Jesus said to them, like, in the past, like, in his earthly ministry, in his resurrection at Pentecost. That's what they'll refer to. Hebrews 1 says that. He spoke, in these last days, spoke to us by his Son, referring back to his earthly ministry in Hebrews 2 when the Holy Ghost was given. So back at Pentecost. Peter talks about what Jesus taught them to preach back when Jesus spoke to them. It's not like some new information, like, Jesus appeared to me last week and told me this new thing, Second Peter. You don't read that in the Hebrew epistles. But all over Paul's epistles, you hear Paul talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus told me, and he spoke to me, and I'll come to visions, revelations. And this is what Jesus said. Like, you don't find that anywhere else. Apparently, he said it to Paul. Like, over and over, he was saying things to him. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, look at this, for example. Peter never says anything like this. Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. Paul says, The words I spoke to you, even though I'm a man and I was speaking them, um, you received them as they were in truth, the words of God. Because God gave them to Paul, and Paul spoke them, and they heard them and believed them. You see? Peter was also preaching the words of God, okay, but he doesn't talk like this. Paul's going around, like, actually preaching messages, and he's going, that was the words of God you're hearing right there. That sounds like blasphemy, doesn't it? If I said that, you stand up and just yell. You just do it to my face. If I say, I'm preaching, word, I'm saying God's words right now, and they're my words, you just say, blasphemer. And, you know, that'll remind me that, yes, I, I'm human. But Paul's human, too, you know, and he's preaching the words of God because Jesus spoke to him. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. <laughs> He says, you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Wait a minute, Paul, when did Jesus give you commandments? Paul wasn't saved in Acts 2. When did he get commandments of the Lord? Jesus appeared and spoke to him, right? Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 3. After five chapters of Paul explaining to Timothy how to operate this church, he says in verse 3, These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. He's talking about the things he's teaching as the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing is, though, you don't find what Paul is teaching in anywhere in Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus returned and spoke to Paul multiple times. Look at Acts 23, verse 11. Acts 23 and 2 Timothy 4. What were the last words of Jesus? In the book of Acts, the last words, uh, at least as they mark them red, as if that's an authority, the last words you can find in the book of Acts, where Jesus appears to Paul and speaks, is in Acts 23, 11. Now, he may have spoken afterward, but we don't have a record of it, but Acts 23, 11 Paul is on trial for his life for preaching the resurrection of Christ and he's being accused by his kinsmen in the flesh, Jews, of being a blasphemer and they're trying to kill him. There's a plot against his life trying to kill him. An assassination attempt. In Acts 23, 11, Jesus appears and speaks to him words of comfort. In the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. What does Jesus say? The words of Jesus Christ. Be of good cheer, Paul. I'm standing with you, and you will bear witness of me. Where? In Rome. Right? What's the next book in your Bible? Romans. Who wrote it? Paul. You think he just did that off a whim? Or did Jesus himself say, you're going to bear witness of me in Rome? And Paul's going, what? 
No, okay. I'll make sure I write a good one. The best book of the Bible, if you ask me. The book of Romans talking about the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, the mystery of Christ, the body of Christ, your growth in the body of Christ. Wonderful epistle written to the Romans. I think it's interesting that Jesus said that in Acts 23, and then the book of Romans has that place in Scripture. If you look at 2 Timothy 4, in verse 17, Paul remembers this. At the very end of his ministry, in 2 Timothy, Paul writes, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Remember that? I remember that. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. We read over this like it sounds a spiritual language. Because Christians talk like this, like spiritual language all the time. Paul spoke and knew the Lord Jesus Christ in a way, I'm not trying to glorify Paul at all, but he knew and spoke to Jesus Christ in a way that you never have. Okay? But we'll see here in a bit here, that's part of that mystery information. Because Jesus spoke to Paul and said, you're going to be a witness of me in Rome, and I'm standing by you. And Paul says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Right? He's referring to the Lord's appearances and work with him. You see, the way he talks like that, the Lord stood with me. Right? Peter, you read Peter's epistles, and he, he's believing the Lord Jesus is the Christ, but he's always talking about Jesus like over there. Like, he's gone now, but he's going to come back. He's going to come back. And he will. It's true. But when Paul writes about Jesus, he says, I spoke with him. I, he stood with me. And in fact, Paul's teaching of the mystery is what? Christ is in you. There's a different relationship you have to Jesus Christ and the body of Christ than Peter and the 12 apostles of the Hebrew epistles ever had. Christ is your head. Is he in heaven? Yes. Is he absent from the earth? Yes. But you are his body. There is a connection you have to the further revelation of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that other apostles in the past didn't have. It's a fascinating thing to appreciate. Okay, 2 Timothy 4 verse 17 then says, He stood with him and strengthened him. How are you strengthened? Know you not the Lord, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay. Let's cover a few things here. Christians say, Jesus speaks to me today. Well, let me tell you and warn you that if it's not according to the inspired scripture, then you're borderline blaspheming. Blasphemy is you attributing things to God that he never said, never did. Okay? Don't blaspheme. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go back to the red letters of Matthew, Luke, and John, the reason why they don't seem to apply to you is because they don't. Jesus spoke later, and you can find your instructions and doctrine for yourself from the Lord Jesus Christ in the epistles given to the apostles of the Gentiles. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Paul writes, Words from Jesus Christ, when Jesus said unto Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee. That's mystery truth Jesus spoke to you through Paul. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, A dispensation was given to me to you, word. Who gave the dispensation to Paul? Jesus Christ. Right? So you might understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. How did Paul get that knowledge? Jesus Christ. That you might know the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Right? The mystery which was hid in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. I wonder who told Paul about that. Jesus Christ did. Okay. In Colossians 1.27, the mystery among these Gentiles is Christ in you. The great mystery is that Christ isn't just dead. He's not just resurrected. He's not just in heaven. It's not just that he'll return. That's all that's prophesied. The mystery is that while he's in heaven, he's in you. What? Yes, mystery truth. That's what that is. He's in heaven, but you're not looking at him like, he's over there, and uh, I hope to see Jesus sometime soon. Yeah, we're still looking for him to return, but you're his body, you understand. And the words that Jesus Christ said after he rose from the dead can dwell in you and live in you so that you can walk by the words of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Those are the ones you need. Right? The Colossians 3.16, what does Paul admonish the Colossians? We have it on the front of our grace hymnal. So you get a grace hymnal. Just look at the cover, right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ. Which ones? Like, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The words of Christ that he revealed and gave to your apostle. Those are the words that should be dwelling in you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. That's not the one I want. I want Ephesians 3.17. Ephesians 3.17. Paul prays 
that, that the Ephesians will be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Christians talk like this, right? Is Jesus in your heart? What does that mean? I mean, that, that, what does that actually mean? But Paul says it. The only time he mentions any language like that is right here. Christ may dwell in your heart. Like the clearest heart language in the scripture right there. But how does Christ dwell in your heart? What's it say? By faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the words of God. What words from God? Matthew, Luke, and John? See, that matters, doesn't it? The words of God dwelling in your heart is how Christ dwells in your heart. Otherwise, where are you, Lord? You're absent. Don't know where you're at. Right? If you hear the words of Lord Jesus Christ, he can dwell in your heart by faith. That's the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, that's why Paul prays in Ephesians 1, that the God, God the Father would grant you the understanding and wisdom to know the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and the power of his resurrection so he can dwell in you. That's why he says you are his body. But you're not living like it if you don't know the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? It makes all the difference what Jesus said after he rose from the dead and appeared to the Apostle Paul. It makes all the difference. Galatians 4.19, Paul is worried about the Galatians. Why in Galatians 4? Because they're following the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke them under the law. In Galatians 4.19, he says, I travail in, in, in birth until what? Christ be formed in you. What was their problem? They weren't walking after the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is by grace, right? So he's working that Christ be formed. How, is, how does that work? I mean, how do you form Christ in someone? I mean, how do you, you lay hands on them? What, what do you do? Paul preaches words, doctrines, so that by faith they can hear and the word gets in them and suddenly Christ can now be formed in them, right? You being the body of Christ, after all. You can actually live according to who you are and who Christ made you to be, which is a member of his body. You see, if the, bo the body is a unit and the head is in heaven, you're attached to the head, right? So the connection you have to heaven is that, well, my head is there and uh, one day he'll drag me up, right? Peter's connection to Jesus was he's the king and he's in a far, far country and I hope he comes back. Different relationship, right? The mystery is your relationship, if you look at Ephesians 4, verse 20, this is the content of the words of Jesus as he spoke to you. That's why this is significant. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 20, you have not so learned Christ. He's kind of rebuking him a little bit here. You have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, we won't deal with the specific doctrines in Ephesians 4 right now. But what is Paul saying there? He's saying that Jesus can teach you and you can hear Jesus. And what does he mean by that? Don't spiritualize this and say, I woke up in the morning and had an unction from the Lord. This is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as are written right here. He's correcting them with the doctrine. He's saying, if you know the words of Jesus Christ for you today, then you know what the truth is. You know how to speak the truth in love. You know how to grow the body of Christ. You know what Christ is doing in you. You know God's will. Right? But if you don't walk accordingly, then he says, you have not so learned Christ, and you haven't heard Christ. Here's how you hear Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Here's how you hear Christ. It's the words that he gave to Paul, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how you hear him. I want to hear Jesus today. You better read the last words that he said. That's how you hear him. Because he'd spoken to you, Gentiles. Right? Look at 2 Timothy 2.7. 2 Timothy 2, 7, Paul says, Consider what I say. Paul recognizes he is not the Lord. He's just a messenger, a servant, an apostle. But he knows the seriousness of the words that he says, because the words he says are words that Jesus gave to him to say. Consider what I say and what happens. And you will understand all things. That's not what he says. Consider what I say and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. What's he saying? What, by what I'm saying is how the Lord is teaching you, right? He says, I'm speaking the words, but it's Jesus doing the teaching. Don't spiritualize this. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to... No, no it's the word. Like, he's saying the words I'm writing to you are as if Jesus is talking to you. I mean, I, you consider what I say and the Lord will give you understanding. Because what I'm saying are the words of the Lord. That's what he means by that. Okay? Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 22. 
The very last verse Paul writes, after he says, you know who taught you these things, you know all scripture is sufficient and, and inspired by God and is profitable to make man of God perfect, chapter 3, you, you know these doctrines, you know who you've learned them from, you know the pattern and way of life, you know all this stuff, Timothy. And at the very last verse, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. That's, that's a little different. Paul finishes his other epistles with things like grace be unto you and the grace of Jesus Christ be with you. And there he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Why does he say that? I thought he was in heaven. He is in heaven. But remember, he's the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, invisible God who dwells in you when you hear his words, according to the mystery. You believe these words and hear this truth written to you by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can be with you. That's interesting. When you think of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, you shouldn't think of him as a first century Jew walking around, multiplying loaves and walking on water. That's true. But Jesus Christ today is a glorified Lord in heaven who is your head, who is the lifeblood of your Christian life. Right? He speaks to you these words, and he can dwell in you. What Jesus Christ looks like today is the Savior of sinners, putting you and me together in the body. He's what connects me and you. He's what connects us to this book and to God. God, he's, he's much more than the first century Jew that you write about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? He's more excellent. He's according to the mystery, right? All right, I hope that gave you some insight a little bit to uh, why asking the question and why studying that out may be significant to who you are in Christ. And it may be a good approach, too, to deal with people as they think that you talk about Paul all the time. Well, talk about Jesus and the last words that he spoke because that'll lead you to the last person he spoke to in Scripture. Any comments, any questions? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace and the words that you spoke to us. And we cherish each one knowing that you've made them perfect for our furnishment and our equipment. I pray that we would acknowledge them. We have them in front of us. We know that we should read them and know them. And yet we don't always live by them. And we pray that those words would work in us to change our thinking and our habits and our life and our reactions and responses to people so that we actually can be your body members, can be your feet and hands and mouth and shoulders and all that. Lord, we thank you for the glory you promised us by your son and all the riches that you've given us that we rarely appreciate. As we start this new year, I pray that we would use them more frequently to do your will. Amen.